Welcome to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast, where we deconstruct the methods, marketing, and mindset of successful business people and chiropractors from around the world. And now your host, Dr. Richard Day. Hello, hello. I am Dr. Richard Day, and this is the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast. Thanks again for checking in with me. Well, today on the show, we are going to talk about something I get asked a lot about, and that is the idea of going all cash. And who better to get this information than from a doctor who has been all cash from the beginning? She's not only been all cash, but she has mastered the all cash practice model. Dr. Michelle Winling graduated summa cum laude from Life West Chiropractic College. She also has a bachelor's degree from Colorado State University in exercise and sports science. She has over 25 years experience working on the human body, including massage therapy, physical therapy, and as a personal trainer. She was voted Rising Star Chiropractor of the Year by the Colorado Chiropractic Association in 2013 and 2015, and she has been the president of the Colorado State Board of Chiropractic Examiners since 2013. In addition, she teaches chiropractors all over the country the keys to running a successful cash practice, including marketing strategies to improve their patient retention, increase referrals, and revenues. Welcome, Dr. Michelle Windling. Feel free to fill in any gaps in the bio that I may have missed. Thank you, Rich. Uh, the only thing that you missed, because that was a great bio. Thanks so much for speaking so highly of me. Um, I own All Seasons Chiropractic Sustainable Health Center, and uh, uh, it's a 100% cash practice, referral-based um, practice, and I just love going to work every day. So that's the only thing I would add to my bio. Well, that's worth mentioning. A cash practice, certainly, and then loving going to work is a big deal. So that's that's important things to add. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So define what you mean by cash practice. I know what that means to me, but why don't you share with our listeners what that means? Absolutely. Cash practice to me means someone who um, does not bill insurance for at least 95% of their patients pay at time of service. So, and I get this question a lot, uh, especially from students. They want to know: Should I go all cash? Should I should I go insurance? Should I, and of course, you'll if you do insurance, you're going to end up taking both. But um, why do cash as opposed to insurance? Other than, I mean, I know insurance can be a headache from experience. Are there other reasons? There's there's a myriad of reasons. Now, in, cash is not for everybody, and I I totally get why people do insurance because with a really good billing insurance company. A uh, really good biller, you can do a fabulous job and make good money at it as long as someone else is holding that headache, like you said, for you so you don't have to continuously chase that money. Uh, the reason I did cash is because I like to get paid at time of service. I feel like whatever they're paying you out of their pocket is what they value you. So if they're valuing you at a $20 copay, that's actually what your value is to them. Whereas if they're paying the full $65 and that's what they value you, um, they hold you in a higher esteem. They're also more likely to do their homework exercises, more likely to uh, continuously come in and, uh, you know, create that, you've created that value for them. Uh, You also get much more loyal patients Because when their insurance changes, a lot of insurance patients will fall off and drop off. Um, You also have a much lower overhead, which is one of the main reasons I did cash instead of insurance, so I didn't have to pay a billing company. Um, And then you can dedicate all of your time to your patient, and you are actually in charge of um, what, how you treat your patient versus convincing a third party how you want to treat your patient. And that way, the value you're creating is just between you and the patient, and it's never between you and a third party. So have you found it to be a challenge at all in uh, explaining to patients how this works? For example, when we opened our practice, the first two years we were cash only, and we would have people call up and they would say, do you take my insurance? And I would explain to them that, um, well, we're not in insurance networks, but here is what we charge. And in many cases, it was below the copay. Um, but there was a certain number of people that didn't get it. They didn't. They would say, "Well, but wait a minute, you don't take my insurance," and it it seemed to create a problem. Has that been a problem for you? We don't really have a problem uh, when people call in and say, "Do you take my insurance?" Because typically, what we do is let them know that we do super billing. But the first thing you always want to do before you even talk about money or billing, you always want to create value for the service that you do. 
And so my office manager will always say, you know, Dr. Michelle chooses to adjust every joint in your body as well as give you homework exercises so you don't have to come in as often. And at the end of your visit, we're going to go ahead and provide you with a super bill. You'll send the super bill into your insurance company and then they send you the check in the mail if it's covered. So you'll always get a check in the mail. And that's always something the patients want to hear. They want to hear the the fact that they're going to get paid for coming in to see me. Obviously, they have to pay at time of service and they get that. Now, going cash, is that something that you think every chiropractor should do? Definitely not for everybody. Absolutely not. Um, I do... I do teach chiropractors all over the state of Colorado how to switch from insurance to cash when they've had too many headaches and they're just over it or they just want to lower their overhead or whatever. Um, But it's definitely not for everybody Um, because the trick with going cash is you have to get really, really good at patient education. That's my very, very favorite part of practice. I love educating my patients. It's my favorite thing in the world. So for me, going cash was a no-brainer. But for a lot of chiropractors who don't want to spend that much time educating their patients, just want to get in, do the adjustment, go on to the next patient, then a cash practice may or may not be as effective for them. So one of the things that I've found, and I wanted to know your opinion, if you've seen the same thing or uh, or not, is that local insurance can vary a lot state to state. It's all based on local state laws. And uh, for example, what works for me in Kansas City as a cash practice may not work in California. So do you coach, I guess I have two questions, do you coach people all over the United States? And if so, do you take into consideration what's going on in their local insurance environment? Absolutely. So being the president of the state board, I very, very much follow the rules and regulations. I can coach anyone in any district. Um, I know Colorado the best because this is where I, I live and breathe. However, yeah, you definitely do have to take into consideration all of the rules and regulations and policies that the state board has put in place. Mostly the insurance regulations are fairly similar across the board. Um, and, you know, things that you need to watch out for is if you're already in network with an insurance company, there's often clauses in there that say you cannot take cash from the specific patient until you get out of network. So sometimes, you know, those are things that I coach people on specifically is to make sure they read their policies and all that so that they for sure don't step on any toes as they're switching from insurance to cash. And that way it makes it a fairly smooth transition and all they have to do is create value for those patients. Most of their patients are going to stay with them anyway because they love what they do and they love who they are. So what advice do you have for the chiropractor who is in insurance networks and is thinking of getting out? I know uh, from experience there's someone that I worked for that always said they were going to do it, but at the last minute it was fear that held them back. Yeah, fear is a really big motivator, isn't it? Um, Yeah, it's actually not that scary. Every single doc that I've mentored to switch from insurance to cash has, um, within about three months, made more money, um, had a better life balance, and way less stress. Uh, it's not difficult. It, there's little tiny steps. There's, there's some systematized procedures that you need to do that, that help you get there. But mainly what they're afraid of is that patients are going to leave. Patients typically will not leave someone they're very comfortable with. As long as you create the value and it explain to them the reason you're going from insurance to cash. And that reason, you know, is going to be things like, you know, the insurance environment's not as friendly to chiropractors anymore. And they know that. They go, oh, yeah, yeah, Obamacare, blah, blah. So so they get it. They already know that insurance is a terrible thing. And they get it. And then you say, and from here, I'd really like to be able to continue to do the great level of care that I've given you all along. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to switch to this cash rate. So it's just going to be this one low cash rate. You're not ever going to have to worry about any other rates. And I know that's that's another question you're going to bring up. I think one fee, one fee for all of your services is super key. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But that, you know, that's the key. And then you create value for that one single fee. And it's just amazing. They just stay and they love it. And they send you way more people because now they don't think, oh, gosh, yep, Joe's not in network with you because he works at the company down the street. They don't think about that anymore because it's not relevant. So now they start sending you tons and tons of patient referrals regardless of what insurance plan they're in. And it's it's a beautiful thing. So I want to drill down on, on this process a little bit. I guess if I was in network right now and considering getting out of network and going all cash, what does that timeline look like? Is that a 90-day process? Is that a six-month or a year? How long does that transition take? Well, so you can transition fairly quickly, but what I recommend to docs is that they give their patients at least 30 days notice so that they put a little piece of paper on the front desk that patients can see 
that says in 30 days, this is what is going to happen and then train their staff really well um, so that their staff knows how to create value for what it is that they do as well. And just let them know in 30 days, Sally, we're no longer going to be using insurance. So instead, when you come in, instead of paying the 45 or 55 or whatever that is copay, you're actually just going to pay $65. It's the same every time. It'll still go towards your deductible. It'll You'll still get credit for it with your insurance. And as you submit these super bills, you're going to start getting checks in the mail that will, that will balance out that extra $10 that you typically get, um, that you typically pay or save or whatever. And then from there, you want to make sure that you can get out of network with these different providers and the different providers are all going to have different time frames. So you can't just say, okay, I'm no longer with Aetna because Aetna has this, this provider time frame where if someone's under their insurance plan, they cannot pay cash. It's illegal for them to pay cash for an adjustment, even if the patient wants to. So you kind of have to make sure that if you're an in-network provider, if you're out of network provider and doing insurance, it's, it's a lot easier to step out. So that would be my first step if someone's just thinking about it. Step into the out of network box, kind of step back a little bit, and then then work your way into it. But if you want to just do it, I have, I have practices that transfer um, and transition completely within two to three months. So should they expect a dip in revenue? I mean, should they save up for this? Or is that too much of a case-by-case basis to be able to answer? I've only had one practice out of all of them that I mentored that had a dip in revenue. And she had a dip in revenue more because she was so afraid to create value for what it was that she did that people didn't even understand that she wanted them to come back. She actually accidentally sent the message to her patients that I'm not insurance anymore. I can't see you anymore. So... Other than that, I've never seen a dip in revenue from this. So you mentioned that you have a flat fee for your services. Uh, let me, I guess let me start by asking what services do you provide in your office? Sure, absolutely. I do full body chiropractic adjustments, meaning I adjust the feet, ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, elbows, jaw, TMJ, everything, and of course the spine. We do homework exercises to restabilize the body after the adjustment's complete and some rehabilitation work um, as far as muscle work and, and soft tissue as well. Is this all done by hand? Are you using any modalities for this or it's all you, the provider, doing it? It's pretty much all me. I love using my hands. I did massage for 20 years, and so I'm very much into using my hands to make things feel better. So when it comes to capped fees, then when you prepare that super bill, are you coding based on individual services provided or how are you coding that to give to their insurance provider? So typically... The purpose of the super bill is, is for reimbursement. It's not to educate the provider on what it is you're doing with that patient. Um, in my opinion, that's really none of their business, aside from the fact that, yes, I did a chiropractic adjustment, so I'll code for that. If I did just an extremity adjustment, I'll code for that. And then if there's um, muscle therapy, muscle rehabilitation, I can code for that as well. But because it's a single fee schedule, if you just circle just the chiropractic adjustment and it's exactly your fee, that makes the insurance company pretty happy. I have never had an insurance company come to me and say, you know, gee, you need to charge extra for all these other things. We owe you more money. I have yet to see that happen. So let me ask you about personal injury patients. If you've treated those um, in the past, you know that they um, there can be a lot of extra that goes into the note taking and reimbursement through them can be higher. How do you handle those cases? So our policy in our office is if somebody that we love and care for, in other words, our patients or someone that our patients love and care for, get in a motor vehicle accident, we are happy to bill that car insurance company. Um, my my notes are actually the same regardless. I have very extensive notes. I'm a very big note nerd. So um, my notes are actually more to support my patient care than it is for the insurance company. I want to know exactly what position I adjusted that patient in so that the next time they come in and say, gee, doc, what you did last time was amazing. I want to make sure to do that exact same move again. And since we have so many tools in our toolbox, my notes are very extensive, so I know exactly what that tool was. Um, So my notes don't have to change at all, which is delightful. But yeah, we got to do the HICFA forms and those kinds of things. Um, which my my uh, office managers will submit. Uh, the only time I will turn down a motor vehicle accident is if the med pay is used up, if there were lots of other medical providers in the accident, or if the patient was at fault. 
those are all high risk situations. And uh, I'm lucky enough in my practice that I get to choose which patients to accept and which ones not to. And uh, I have some fabulous chiropractors in my network that are really, really great. And they will take really good care of those patients. And then those patients can come back to me um, should they choose to do that at the end of the motor vehicle accident. So a different patient type, Medicare patients, how do you handle those folks? So we're not really on the, the radar of Medicare because we don't build a, we don't uh, adjust the spine of patients who are Medicare. Uh, the only reason you need to bill Medicare is if you're doing a 98940, 98941 um, for uh, specific for people over age 65. So we do a lot of rehabilitation, homework exercises, and soft tissue work. And those people feel amazing when they get off the table. Well, I'm going to move on to some more general things. What is really exciting you in your business today? (laughs) There's so many things. I love my job. (laughs) It's just just the most amazing job on the planet. Um, I love seeing people's lives change every single day. And the coolest thing about chiropractic, I I was a physical therapist. I, I worked as a personal trainer and a massage therapist for many years. And the one cool thing that chiropractic has that no one else has is the fact that we change people's lives almost overnight because the adjustment releases the serotonin, the dopamine, the vasopressin, the oxytocin, and all of that, which gives them more happy thoughts and a better outlook on life. And it's really easy to address their body issues. You know, biomechanically, boy, do we have that. That's that's down. We got that. The, you know, someone comes in with biomechanical issue. Psh. Bring it on. I got that. So it's a lot of fun to see people's lives change on a regular basis. That's the most exciting thing. And the fact that my patient being mostly referral practice, patients always refer people who are like them. So since I love all my patients, when they send someone new in, I know I'm going to love them too. And that's really cool. Uh, What vision do you have for the future of your practice? At this point, um, we have an incredibly long waiting list for new patients. And as cool as that sounds, it's incredibly frustrating. So I am going to be looking to hire another chiropractor because at this point, uh, you know, we've got about a three and a half, four month wait to get a new patient in. And uh, so I'd like to be able to see people sooner. And so I'm going to be looking for another chiropractor. The other super fun thing on the radar is... uh, the online practice enhancement and mentoring videos that I've created. So that will launch in September of 2016 and hopefully will give every single chiropractor the ability to have the super busy practice of his or her dreams um, so they can be the best chiropractor for themselves. So I know it's early in putting that together and it has not launched yet, but why don't you give us a few minutes just sort of a preview as to what it is, how it's going to work and what your vision for that is. Absolutely. I'm so excited about it. And since it is in its infancy stage, I'm sure it will transition over time. But right now, it's a myriad of multiple different kinds of videos um, that are designed for practice enhancement. So there's a section on um, assessment, adjustment, rehabilitation, homework exercises, and soft tissue work for patients. So that's the patient care section. And then there's a section on practice uh, building. And so that is all designed on internal and external marketing how to enhance patient education, how to have the most kick-ass customer service possible so that every single patient that comes in has the highest possible patient experience from the moment they walk in the door until they leave the office and all the different systems in between staff training you name it. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty extensive website and it's, it's a lot of fun to see practices change over time just based on those principles. Well, I want to shift now a little more towards that direction and just talk about chiropractic success in general. And I think I know the answer to this question, but are the procedures in your office systematized? (laughs) You do know the answer. (laughs) Absolutely, they are. The only way you can provide the best and most consistent patient experience, which is the whole point of being a chiropractor, in my opinion, is to provide super high customer service and, of course, get people better. We can get people better in our sleep. But if we can make people feel good from the moment they walk in the door to the moment they leave our office and they continue to feel good for the whole rest of the week and talk about us and do all these great things, I mean, we've really, really lived up to our name. Um, And so, yeah, every single system is actually designed in my practice to make the patient feel their best. So we have everything from thank you cards to reminder calls to scheduling and all of those things are very well systematized to make the patient feel loved, adored, appreciated, and really, really taken care of. 
I, I couldn't agree more with that. In fact, I didn't realize this when I went into practice, but the visits to the chiropractor for some folks was the sort of the oasis. They had a hectic family life and the rest of just their daily lives are the things that bring them down. But when they came into us for relief of pain, I found that along with relieving their pain came just a whole lot of other great things. And, and by making that, recognizing it, and then raising that whole experience to make every contact with that patient something above what their, you know, the rest of their day is when they walk outside of our doors, that became something that we integrated into what we do in our offices. And I'm on the same page as you. I mean, I absolutely see that day in and day out. It, it almost never happens that you look forward to going to your doctor, but all of our patients truly look forward to seeing us. And that's why being a chiropractor is so amazing. Well, let me ask you this. Are there any key performance indicators that you think chiropractors should pay attention to, the daily visits or whatever? You know, I think the most important factor is retention for sure, but referrals, because if you're doing really great patient education and your patient truly values what you do, they are referring Joe, Bob, Sally, Sue, everybody into your office and trying to refer their dogs in too, but I don't do animal care. (laughs) But yeah, that's what you want. You want them to consistently be referring into your office. And that's how you know you're doing a great job. When we talk chiropractic in the chiropractic language, a lot of people miss it. But when we speak chiropractic and translate it into English, it becomes magic because people get it. They understand it and they're able to repeat it to their loved ones and their loved ones come in our door and then we can fix them too. And eventually we create world peace and that's really fun. (laughs) Well, this is a theme I see that comes up a lot when talking to other chiropractors. And I think if you, if I could boil it down to one word, it's communication. It's the ability to take this complicated doctor idea that we have and really bring it down to a language that is accessible to everyone and that everyone can identify within themselves um, to, to go ahead and make those changes and for them to embrace what it is we're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, anything that can help that process because you don't get it in school and for good reason. But when you get out there talking to people, certainly if we can make ourselves better at communicating the message, I think it's not only going to help our profession, but our patients as well. Absolutely. It will raise the number of percentage because right now we're seeing about 13.8% of the population. That's pretty sad. And that's mostly because we're not capable of speaking English when we get out of school and then we continue to speak chiropractic. And there's, there's certainly some value to that. But if the patients don't get it, they also can't send in their buddies. Well, what's working for you? You mentioned referrals. Do you do other forms of promoting in your office? And if so, what is working the best for you right now? The best practice promotion, hands down, no question, is patient education, period, end of story. I actually have two eight-hour talks just on patient education alone. However, in a nutshell, the best way you can possibly support and continuously feed your practice, because the kind of practices I want all chiropractors to have are the sustainable ones, where you can go away for two months and come back, and your practice is still booming. Those people are still there, and they're still excited to see you. So that kind of the patient education is absolutely the key for that. Um, anytime you can educate someone in your office about the fact that you're addressing their entire body, people will come into your office and they think, oh, she fixed my back pain. So now they leave thinking she only fixes back pain. And uh, so instead, as you're addressing their body, say, how are those knees, Sally? And Sally says, oh, my knees are great. I don't have knee pain. And you're like, great. Awesome. How are those feet? How are those shoulders? And so on. Now Sally's starting to think, you know, Bob came into the office the other day with a lamp and he said he hurt his knees. I wonder if she fixes his knees. And so that kind of continuous practice promotion is patient education. That's, that's the biggest thing. You can have a hundred percent cash based referral practice with a waiting list. If you just educate, educate, educate. So this podcast is all about providing actionable content for our listeners. So what single piece of advice or action steps would you give to, to the new doc who is getting ready to go out for the first time and start their practice, and also something for the doctor who is stuck, who's been ex- who's experienced and been around a while, but is looking for something different. What can they do starting tomorrow or next week to start this transition? Absolutely. And I was thinking as you were saying that, that there's a little bit of advice for students as well. So I'm just going to throw that in real quick. Um, as far as students go, I think they should shadow as many chiropractors as they possibly can so that they can start picking the brains of those chiropractors and see if that chiropractor and the way they practice truly makes that chiropractor happy and see if that was, that would be what make them happy. And then for a new doc, 
the biggest key is to keep your overhead low because there's nothing worse than financial stress. So you got to keep your overhead incredibly low. Do not discount your prices. That's a bunch of silliness. Don't do Groupons. Don't do those things. Instead, have a low entry fee. In other words, your physical exam fee being low. And then your adjustment fee is just your adjustment fee. You do not discount it. You don't try to find ways to save people money left and right. That is not your job. Your job is to create value so that those people will come in. I see lots of practices fail because people have the hardest time speaking their value and asking for money. And you deserve the money. You do an amazing job. I mean, people will value you exactly what it is you're charging. So if you're charging them only $30, they're only going to value you that. So if you're truly worth 65, step up and charge 65. And then if you're a really experienced doc, my favorite thing to do with experienced docs is to sit down and talk to them about their practice. Find out what is really working and they love doing every day and then make a short list of the things they really don't love. Because usually when they're stuck, it's because something is draining their energy. Something is sucking that energy dry. And so they need to kind of look at it. And if there's things that are really tiring them out, the best thing to do is to delegate those things out or cut those out of the practice altogether. A lot of times I'll have a doc who says, you know, I've got this multi-level marketing thing that I'm doing in my office and it's just draining me. I just feel like it's just not who I am. And so I ask him, well, what would happen if you stopped? And they're like, well, I never thought about that. It's like, well, if you don't love it, stop doing it and do more of the things you love so that you can jumpstart your practice. And then find things like these podcasts. These podcasts are great to light people back up and to get them excited to go to work on Monday morning again. That excitement needs to be there because it takes a lot of energy to be an entrepreneur and to run your own practice. And then you can love being a chiropractor every single day going to work. And that's the way it should work. Yeah, it's so simple. I think it's easy to lose sight, especially after a number of years in practice. If you're not, are you doing what it is you love every day? The the other day I was looking at, uh, I, mean, I play guitar and I was looking at a, a guitar that a guy wanted to sell and I ended up saying, no, thanks. I don't want it. And he couldn't believe it. And he said, why not? And I said, well, recently in my life, I only buy things I love and I like your guitar, but I don't love it. And it's so simple. But once you sort of get in tune with that, it really helps guide a lot of things. And I think maybe people don't even realize that over time they've ended up in a place that they don't love doing things that they don't love either. And a lot of people settle out of fear. They think someone taught them that this is the only way to do it. And so they don't look outside of that to a way that would be more exciting for them. Like spinal screenings, for instance, a lot of docs are like, oh, I got to send my CA because I am not doing that. There's actually really, really fun ways to do events like that where you leave the event more excited than you set up your table in the morning. And so you just have to find that spark and find that fun and, and bring fun back into your practice. Well, before we move on, I want to jump back to one thing. You said that you do the majority of the work or all of it yourself working with your hands. So how does this translate in terms of a patient visit? Are they 30 minutes? Are they 15? How long do you usually spend with a patient? I typically spend 30 or excuse me, 15 minutes with a patient. Uh, so it's an hour for the initial exam and consultation because most of that is patient education. The second visit is 30 minutes because that's a ton of patient education. Um, and I don't mean sitting someone down in front of a television watching that. Instead, I choose to educate them specifically on what's going on with their body with an eye to eye contact as we walk through their body as I'm working on them. And then every visit after that is 15 minutes. Well, we are nearing the home stretch of this interview. I want to talk about the bigger picture. And as you know, we learn a lot from our successes, but we can learn even more from our failures. So give me an example of a failure or a challenge you have overcome in your life, what you learned, what you did to overcome it, and tell us a little bit about that event if there was one. Well, so my biggest challenge is actually the challenge I see most of my mentees having as well, and that is creating and being able to articulate the value of what it is that we do. Some people even graduate from school not quite sure what we do as chiropractors. Well, we get a joint moving. What does that mean? How does that work? Does Why would people pay for that? And so finding out, first of all, what kind of value they're bringing to the table and then how to articulate that in English. And so what I found is that slowly over time, if you use the patients, so the patient will come in and they'll say, you know, hey, I have this goal, I have this issue, I have this thing I want to fix. And if you talk to the patient in their own language, so if they say things like, 
you know, I've got a wonky neck. You say, okay, so for that wonky neck, we're going to blah, 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 blah. That helps a bunch because then you're reconnecting with the patient using their language. And then you start explaining to them on every single visit, every single time they come in, exactly how they're doing better, what it is you're going to do next, and what that next visit will bring. And every single time you do that, you're creating value for the journey of chiropractic that they're on um, with you. And that seems to make a huge difference as far as that, you know, keeping people in your office and having them continue treatment, because that's the complaint I hear the most often is I get them better and then they leave. And that is lack of patient education. You should get them better and they should be able to get further and further out in visits. I only see most of my patients every six to eight weeks. It's really rare. It's really rare that I have to see someone very frequently, but they all come back because they understand the value of the adjustment and they understand the value of having someone look at their body from head to toe. And I had to learn that slowly over time through creating more patient education. When you think of the word successful, who or what do you think of and why? Um, success to me is loving going to work every single day and being able to look at my list of patients and smile because every single one of them I'm looking forward to seeing. And, uh, then in addition to that, loving work, of course, is loving your life outside of work and having lots of life balance. Uh, my husband and I travel at least every three months, if not more often, um, because I think having a healthy life balance and, and travel time and time off work is super essential to keeping your energy up. And then having the financial freedom to do that um, comes from a loving your work and being really good at it. And so that's what success is to me. What is the worst business advice you've ever received? <laughs> I think the worst business advice I've ever received um, is when someone tells you not to be yourself, you know, nobody's going to come to you because you're that. And, uh, the worst business advice possible is, is to try to be something you're not to try to implement a system that doesn't light you up to try to sell a, um, you know, something that, that you don't actually believe in is the worst possible thing. Cause your patients will see right through it all the way to the core and, uh, they won't be referring their patients and they won't be coming back. I wholeheartedly agree with what you're talking about. Early on, I read through some materials that a practice management group handed me, and it was a script, and it sounded so stilted, and I absolutely detest scripts, and I think that's one of the worst things you can do. I was lucky enough, or unlucky, but I, I'm going to say it's lucky. I was lucky enough to sit in with a doc shortly after I graduated. You mentioned shadowing. I was shadowing this guy, and I gave, I heard him give one of the most stilted, rehearsed, scripted report of findings. It was incredible. And uh, I mean, I couldn't believe it. If I were on the receiving end of that, I was would not be buying into it, making a connection of any kind. And sure enough, in about a year, this particular person went out of business, I'm sorry to say, but I thought it was just terrible. So I think being your authentic self and true to yourself is golden. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned scripts because the purpose of a script isn't to say exactly what the script says. The purpose of a script is so that you can continuously convey a feeling and evoke an emotion so that you, you know, our scripts in our office are designed to make the patient feel fabulous. So even from that first reminder phone call, it is scripted, but it's scripted not like, hey, you have to read this. It's scripted like you're going to make them smile and this is how. Right. So it's a whole different focus for a script, which is really uh, delightful. And then it changes the patient experience. So yeah, the script is only as good as, as its intention. Yeah. And I think maybe that was lost on, on some folks there. You're not supposed to rehearse uh, and recite specific lines, but learn what it is you're trying to convey there and be able to convey that message, I think is what you're saying. Exactly. Well, what is the best business advice you've received? Uh, the best, by far the best business, business advice is exactly the opposite of the worst. And what that is, is to truly be your authentic self. Um, you are only, you're the only you on this planet. You are unique and you are the best you. Yeah, you're the only you, but you're definitely the best you. And so when you come to the table with your passion and your gifts and your excitement, the patients will see that and they will follow you and they will love you and they will talk about you. And so the more authentic you can be, people are attracted to that. It's just, it's such a gift to be able to give your patients the authentic you because you're the only one who can give them that. So you want to really be focused on yourself 
Um, you want to be focused, excuse me, you want to be focused and stay focused on the vision um, of your dream practice. And once you've got, you are just you, you're being your authentic self, you're focused on your dream practice, then you truly will be the best chiropractor that you can be for your patients. You'll be the best chiropractor you can be for your, your practice, which will build and grow and bring you lots of revenue. And for yourself, you'll have better life balance. The more authentic you are, the happier you're going to be, the more serotonin and dopamine is going to be flowing around in that brain of yours. And it's just, it's just great to be authentic. And really, that's the only way you can be and be true. Dr. Wendling, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We are sadly reaching the end of our interview. What is the best way for our listeners to reach out and make contact with you? You know, if anyone wants more information on things like, you know, how to improve patient retention, patient referrals, or more tools to add to their customer service experience or adjusting, they can always find me at bethebestchiropractor.com. And so by going to bethebestchiropractor.com, you just click on the contact us button and you can email me, ask me all the questions that you need, and you can log in and there's tons of information there. There's a bunch of free videos that anyone can access and it, it's just a great way to kind of light you back up again. So I would look forward and welcome any information or any questions from anyone. Well, I want to thank you once again for spending part of your day with us. It is absolutely my pleasure, Rich. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast at www.cairobusinessmojo.com.